Welcome everyone to our Mass that is about to begin momentarily for the fifth Sunday of Lent. Uh, we're broadcasting today from the Dominican Friars Chapel at St. Mary Priory in New Haven, uh, attached to St. Mary Church here in New Haven. Those who tuned in last Sunday saw we uh, attempted to do our streaming Mass from the main church uh, in the midst of the scaffolding and everything else. Uh, those who were watching that saw that we had a number of technical difficulties. We are working very hard to resolve those to be able to once again uh, broadcast from the church. But as of right now, we have not worked everything out. So in order to try to provide as smooth uh, a streaming of the Mass as possible, we will do today's Mass here from the Dominican Friars Chapel, as we have been doing for our daily Masses the last several weeks. Before we begin, a uh, warm welcome not only to our own parishioners, to all the friends and family, but in a special way on this day, we give our greetings to all of the members of the Knights of Columbus throughout the world. On um, today, when we celebrate Founders Day, the day when 138 years ago, Venerable Father Michael McGivney first founded and gathered those first men together and founded the Knights of Columbus. So on this day of great rejoicing, uh, warm greetings to all of my brother knights uh, throughout the entire world. And our Mass will begin momentarily. Give me justice, O God, and plead my cause against a nation that is faithless. From the deceitful and cunning, rescue me, for you, O God, are my strength. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and with your spirit. My brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. Lord Jesus, you are mighty God and Prince of Peace. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are Son of God and Son of Mary. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are Word made flesh and splendor of the Father. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. By your help we beseech you, Lord our God. May we walk eagerly in that same charity with which, out of love for the world, your Son handed himself over to death. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord, O my people, I will open your graves and have you rise from them and bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and have you rise from them, O my people. I will put my spirit in you that you may live and I will settle you upon your land. Thus you shall know that I am the Lord. 
I have promised, and I will do it, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. With the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. With the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice in supplication. With the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. If you, O Lord, mark iniquities, Lord, who can stand? But with you is forgiveness, that you may be revered. With the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. I trust in the Lord, my soul trusts in his word. More than sentinels wait for the dawn, let Israel wait for the Lord. With the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. For with the Lord is kindness, and with him is plenteous redemption. He will redeem Israel from all their iniquities. With the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the Spirit if only the Spirit of God dwells in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also, through his Spirit dwelling in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Whoever believes in me will never die. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now a man was ill, Lazarus, from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who had anointed the Lord with perfumed oil and dried his feet with her hair. It was her brother Lazarus who was ill. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, saying, Master, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha, and her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he remained for two days in the place where he was. After this, he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just trying to stone you, and you want to go back there? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in a day? If one walks during the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks at night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. He said this, and then he told them, Our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I am going to awaken him. So the disciples said to him, Master, if he is asleep, he will be saved. 
but Jesus was talking about his death, while they thought he meant ordinary sleep. So then Jesus said to them clearly, Lazarus has died, and I am glad for you that I was not there, that you may believe. Let us go to him. So Thomas, called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go to die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, only about two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary secretly, saying, The teacher is here and asking for you. As soon as she heard this, she rose quickly and went to him. For Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still where Martha had met them. So when the Jews who were with her in the house comforting her saw Mary get up quickly and go out, they followed her, presuming that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he became perturbed and deeply troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how much he loved him. But some of them said, Could not the one who opened the eyes of a blind man have done something? so that this man would not have died. So Jesus, perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench. He has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you, that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me, but, I, but because of the crowd here I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. Now many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen what he had done began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. All three of our readings today that the Church in her wisdom gives us all deal with the theme of death. 
I'll deal with the theme of death not being the end. In our second reading, we're told we are not in the flesh, but rather in the spirit, and that with the presence of Christ, even if the body is dead, uh, the spirit is alive because of righteousness, and that the very spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, giving life to our mortal bodies. Our first reading from the prophet Ezekiel, this great promise, O oh my people, I will open your graves and have you rise from them, and I will put my spirit in you that you may live. And then, of course, the gospel reading, the long gospel we just heard, uh, the resurrection, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Three readings, three different sources, but all conveying the same meaning, that in the power of Christ, in the power of God, in the power of the Spirit, death is not the end, and death does not have final say. And in reflecting upon this idea of, you might say, the non-finality of death, or even more appropriately, the conquering of death by faith, by the power of Christ, I want to reflect on three ways in which this conquering of death is meant to be manifest in our lives. And I'll start with, you might say, the most lofty, and then gradually work my way down uh, to those things, you might say, more of this earth. So the first, and in some ways most obvious one that's coming through loud and clear from these readings, uh, this first conquering of death is literally conquering the conquering of our bodily death in this life. That as we pray, um, one of the prefaces of, of uh, the funeral mass, the Catholic funeral mass, for the believer, life is changed, not ended. And for the believer, the death of our earthly bodies is not our end. It's not close to our end. The death of our earthly bodies, bodies is simply a moment of transition to something different. For those who die in the grace of the Lord, the moment of death is a transition to something so much greater. So we have our Lord who himself, though he was God, took to himself a human nature and in that human nature suffered the horrible passion and the crucifixion and bodily death, conquered that bodily death in his resurrection and in doing so offers that resurrection to all of us. Thus for, for Christians, for believers, we do not fear death in the way the rest of the world, the way ages and ages and ages going past have. Because for us, it is not the end. For us, death is a transition. And in some ways, it is the transition to what we were created for. As good as so many aspects of this world is, this is not what we were created for. This is not our home. The scriptures tell us, while on earth we are strangers and sojourners. Strangers, that is, people who find this earthly existence unusual, bizarre, in some ways unfitting. And sojourners, travelers, who are seeing this entire earthly life as one great pilgrimage. It's a journey. It's not somewhere we're meant to stop. It is a journey. It is a pilgrimage that is aimed at something more beautiful and something greater, and that is the life of the world to come. And in the midst of this time we're in, where the reality of human death and the end of our earthly lives is perhaps in the forefront of our minds, much so than it normally is, there's a human level at which it's natural to be fearful for ourselves, for our loved ones, especially elderly members of our families, those in higher risk. And to have that human fear is in itself okay, but we need to take that 
the motion and then set it in the context of our faith. Our faith which tells us that we are strangers and sojourners and that our earthly life is a good, but our earthly death is a necessary element of us becoming what we were created to be. It's a necessary element for us fulfilling the destiny that we were given from the moment of our creation, and that's to spend all of eternity with God. And so that changes definitively how we look at earthly death. For indeed, through the lens of that, we can see that it opens the door to eternal life. It's the highest level in which death is discussed being conquered here. Um, then there's the second level, um, and this really, the second reading pulls this out. Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. The second death that's being discussed here is the death that comes to us in life, the spiritual death that comes from sin. And it's in the power of Christ and in the power of the Spirit that that earthly death caused by sin can indeed be overcome and conquered. Conquered by the life of the Spirit, conquered for us through the great sacrament of forgiveness, the first we receive known as baptism, and then the great sacrament of forgiveness known as the sacrament of penance or confession. That the death that we experience in our day-to-day -day life every time we sin is something that does not have the final say even here and now. But we can avail ourselves to that spiritual remedy which destroys sin and brings about the forgiveness of sin and new life in the Spirit, namely sacramental grace, the sacramental forgiveness that's offered us. In this life, as much as we struggle and as much as we try, we never are able to avoid sin entirely. And every sin, even the smallest of venial sins, or you might say little bits of death, little bits, tiny bits of death chipping away at us, um, chipping away at our life right now, and the vigor of life we're meant to have here on this earth. And of course, the more serious the sin, the more it chips away at the life that we're meant to have in the here and now. But we have this great remedy, this great remedy of the sacrament of penance, a gift given to us by the Lord, a gift conveyed to us through the priests of the church that the Lord has called to himself and given the power uh, to forgive sins in his name. And so this day, it's another renewed calling to receive this great sacrament of penance, uh, to not allow the death of my own sins uh, to reign in my life, but to know the complete forgiveness, the cleansing, and the true life that we are meant to have through the power of this sacrament, which restores God's grace in its fullness to us and allows us to live in the power of the Spirit, the power of the one who raised Jesus from the dead. And then finally, my last reflection on the power of Christ to raise from the dead is this, and this is at the most horizontal, but still very important level. Lazarus spent four days in the tomb, in the darkness of bodily death. Martha and Mary spent four days, I think you might say, in a tomb of their own, the tomb that is the grief experienced by the loss of Lazarus. All of us, in a certain way right now, are in a tomb, isolated, withdrawn, cut off to a large degree from so many, living in a world that has suddenly become disorienting and strange and empty, quiet, something I've noticed in being outside and even walking. 
is it's so quiet. Streets that are normally a bustle of activity and voices in cars and people talking are just silent. And so all of us are experiencing something of a tomb-like existence right now. And the day is going to come, and we don't know when, whether it's a few weeks from now or a few months from now, but whenever it is, the day is going to come when we emerge from this tomb. And what then? What then? Think about Lazarus when he emerged from that tomb. I can't imagine that he went back to life exactly like it was before. I can't imagine Martha and Mary looking at life exactly like it was before when they had Lazarus restored to them. What will our life be when we emerge from this tomb? I think that's a very important question for us to pray over and to ponder. There's a yearning to go back to life as normal, but is everything that was normal before good? Is everything that was normal before something we ought to want to go back to? Or rather, is this time in the tomb, is this time of loss, this time of grieving of sorts, is it a time for us to completely recalculate and recalibrate what really matters? I, I read online someone posting how, you know, before all this happened, like many families, it was a family with several children, everyone was running off in every direction, and they said it was lucky if once a week they could have dinner together as a whole family. And now, since being isolated, every night, They've had dinner together as a whole family. And this person I was reading on Facebook said, whenever this ends, I don't want to lose that. And we're gonna change our pace and the amount of our activities so that when this ends, we can still have dinner together as a family every night. It's one small example of how this time in the tomb, ironically, this time of death, can lead to a fruitfulness once we emerge. And so I invite all of you to, to really pray over this, to think about it in your own life, think about it as your family, think about it in your parishes and groups you're a part of. What part of the way life was before is something we don't want to go back to? And that now is the time to make the decision to leave that permanently as our past. And what is the new life that we're called to have, the new people we're called to be when the time comes for us to emerge from this time of solitude? I think if we can pray over that well, discern that well as individuals and families and parishes, we can do that, then we will truly, truly see the power of Christ conquering death emerging from the tomb of this pandemic. Amen. We stand now and united with one voice, we profess our one faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. 
For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now, with faith, hope, and charity, we turn to our Heavenly Father, bringing to His glorious throne all of our needs and intentions for this day. For our Holy Father, Pope Francis, and for those who share in the most direct way in his pastoral office in the Church, all of our bishops, especially Archbishop Blair, that during this time of difficulty and confusion, they might lead their flocks in the way of faith and prudence, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for our political leaders at the national, state, and local levels, that they too might exercise sound judgment, prudence, justice, and charity in all of the decisions they enact. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. On this feast, this founding day of the Knights of Columbus, we pray for the Knights of Columbus throughout the whole world, we pray for all of those men who are knights. We pray for those in leadership at the national, state, and local council levels. We pray for all of the good works, charities, ministries um, that are supported by the knights, that are run by the knights, for fruitfulness in their efforts, and for many blessings upon all of their members. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those on the front lines of the crisis we face, our doctors, nurses, and other medical caregivers. We pray for all of our first responders. We pray for those who are working so hard in our food industries, agriculture, the pharmacies, uh, all those responsible for deliveries, um, all those who are working in order to keep at least the basic functions of our society moving forward for their blessings and safety, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all of those who are ill with this virus and all those who are all by themselves in the midst of this crisis, for the family and friends who worry about them, for all those who have died and all of those who will die today, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for all of those needs that we carry with us that rest deep in our own hearts and that we bring in faith to this holy mass this day for all of these needs we pray to the lord lord hear our prayer heavenly father your goodness and mercy are without end and you loved us so much, you sent us your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who underwent his passion, death, and resurrection for our sake, so that the powers of sin and death might not have the final say in our lives. And trusting Father, in the infinite fount of your divine mercy, we bring you all of our prayers and we make them through Christ our Lord. <clears throat>
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Hear us, Almighty God, and having instilled in your servants the teachings of the Christian faith, graciously purify them by the working of this sacrifice. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For as true man he wept for Lazarus his friend, and as eternal God he raised him from the dead. Just as taking pity on the human race, he leads us by sacred mysteries to new life. Through him the host of angels adores your majesty and rejoices in your presence forever. May our voices, we pray, join with theirs in one chorus of exultant praise as we acclaim. Sanctus, Sanctus, Dominus Deus Sabaoth, Pleni sum celia terra, Gloria tua, Hosanna in excelsis, Benedictus, qui venit in nomine Domini, Hosanna in excelsis. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you.
In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mysterio fidei, mortem tuam annunciamus Domine, et tuam resurrectitum in confite mor, donec venias. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with Saint Dominic, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis our Pope and Leonard our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. <clears throat> Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom, there we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress 
as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Agnus Dei, qui tollis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. Agnus Dei, qui tollis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. Agnus Dei, <coughs> qui tollis peccata mundi, Dona eis requiem. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Everyone who lives and believes in me will not die forever, says the Lord. I'll give you a few moments when you are able to do a spiritual communion while I'm purifying the vessels. Read an act of spiritual communion is composed by St. Alphonsus Liguri. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. 
We pray, Almighty God, that we may always be counted among the members of Christ, in whose body and blood we have communion, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Bow down for the blessing. Bless, O Lord, your people who long for the gift of your mercy, and grant that what at your prompting they desire, they may receive by your generous gift, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen.